cars to the back past the initial walking up to the visitor center. We're in a ton of snow. They literally dug it out and the snow is taller than you on the other side. Wow. It should be interesting to see what you Yeah. Oh, the first one was 150. I know. Yeah. I say, what do you do first names? Go. 
Here. Wilson. Burchett. Here. Wilson. Here. Meetings called to order. All right. I'm glad I was laughing because I don't think. Um, under President's report, there isn't anything as far as school related, but um, Sandy just let me know that the gym has to make So, last thought, I got an update at three and she was still good. At, she, uh, that's Bob Hamilton and uh, Dave Hamilton. Friend of Elias, yeah. 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 yeah, so she's a huge supporter of the school and a huge, big, uh, she's always a presence, so she would be missed. Uh, but Sandy thinks maybe Monday is the services and Tuesday is the funeral service. Culinary service. Yeah. Anyway, so our prayers are open. Okay, so we have some updates here before we get into the actual items for recommendation. Uh, a lot of this I've shared um, before and other avenues. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page with this stuff. For this upcoming fall, we do have some internal teaching movements with all of the changes uh, that we had made with the reductions and stuff that we'll talk a little bit later on in the agenda with. Uh, we have the need to move some people around. So Tom McKinnon will be going from fourth grade to third grade. Doris Yerke will be going from fifth grade to third grade. I did. Okay. A while back. Okay. Megan Boot will go from third grade to first grade. Stephanie England from third grade special ed to K through two special ed. Alan Brubacher from 5th grade special ed to 3rd grade special ed. Barb Burley will go from middle school computer and study skills to 4th grade special ed. That middle school computer study skills was one of the positions that we eliminated as part of our 10% reductions. And Pam Burke will go from 4th grade special ed to 5th grade special ed. So outside of all these other things, we do have some internal movements, uh, at, especially at the elementary level, that will be taking place here in a month and a half. Uh, special education changes. Paul Woodard, as you know, has been serving as the district special education supervisor, director, in addition to his middle school principal duties. We have money that gets that gets taken from us as a local school district and goes directly to the Education Service Center here in Forge County. And we don't, that, that's something that automatically happens. We don't have a choice in that. Part of what we receive with those services is then a curriculum person two days a week. Uh, that's kind of what they do for all schools in the county. I asked if we could, instead of getting a curriculum person for two days a week, change that for the same cost to be a special education director. And the county was willing to do that for us. So there's no savings or increase in cost for us. It'll be a net on the money the county deducts from us. But we'll have Lillian Barton with us two days a week as our district special education director. As a result of that, we'll lose Peggy Wyden, who's been here as our curriculum consultant through the county for two days. Peggy's done a really nice job for us, and this is just a matter of us making some decisions on where we felt we had a higher priority of need. Um, so, and then the other change that we're going to make in the special ed area is in consultation with talking to our uh, special education people here in the county and Lillian, we feel that we can get by with fewer days of psych psychological services where testing is done. There was a point where we had um, a number of students that needed to be tested, so we needed more time, but we think we can scale it back two days, which will result in savings for the district uh, if, we're, if we're able to do that. So we will, we will be reducing our psychological services two days per week. We're not exactly sure what savings that will bring us. There's certain uh, part of that arrangement is any any preschool student that's now eligible for services will be done on a on a per student basis, 
cost-wise instead of being something that was done through these extra two days. But we still think we'll end up on the positive side of things with savings because we don't believe we have two days worth of preschool students at testing every week for the uh, The middle school principal, just a brief note on that is, you know, from our last meeting, Paul Woodard has resigned. Matter of fact, probably right now as we speak, he's supposed to be getting board approved over at Newton Falls. So he had a little shame up with that test. Thank for the district. Um, but tonight, in executive session, I'd like to talk about some things in relationship to how we move forward with the middle school principal position. And I'm putting it in executive session under the employment because it is going to involve discussion of other employees that we have here. I think it's, it's better done initially in executive session. This Viking Digital Academy update. We had a meeting scheduled that we, we sent out a letter to the 100 and it was 176 students. It was a little bit more in the fall when we had some of the left. These are the students that are homeschooled, that go to community schools, that are open and rolled. That letter went out to the families of 176 students back at the beginning of June talking about our five-year plan from the district and in particular this Viking Visual Academy that we started and invited them to come to an informational meeting about it somewhere around the 23rd of June, I think it was. We didn't have anybody show. So we're, we're obviously need to do a more personal approach with how we do that. So we are working on, we're working on that. Uh, the other thing that we're working on with this are some guidelines to go with the program for the district. And as I've mentioned before, Teacher-wise, we have the ability to use our teachers here rather than paying the company the $200 per full course for a teacher with the student that fully full time enrolls here. We have the ability to use and pay that money to our teachers here. We have 23 Waterloo teachers that span grades of K through 12 in all subject areas that have expressed an interest in being part of this. So we're getting all of that lined up too. We do actually have a student that's taking the class right now as we speak. She opted to do it through credit flexibility and take geometry over the summer so she can take a higher level in the fall. And so, so far that's been working well. That was done at her expense so there was a credit flexibility option and those costs go to the student. We also have a student that's been placed, that we've placed into our virtual, our digital academy here for the fall, so we will have one full-time student. And our hope is that we'll be able to continue to build this and attract students back here and help our bottom line. Because like we've mentioned before, for every one of the students that comes back, the, the net savings to the district on money we're not then paying out through deductions to other places will be about $4,000 for every student on $700 roughly they go back. So we're going to continue to be aggressive on that and see what we uh, just some updates on summer projects around here. The entrance way to the high school here has been an issue with, especially in the, in the cold months, these pavers rise up some very significantly and we're worried about safety issues out there. So what we're going to do, and we're on the schedule with England for the third week of July, which is next week, and barring any kind of weather delays on their part, we should have this done next week. They're going to be removing all of the papers. We are going to keep those for potential future use in other areas. And that's all going to be concrete, uh, just concrete out here. Um, so that should be done here in the next week or so. We have some areas on the building that have been pretty noticeable. We had some snow damage on gutters. We, uh, Portage Roofing is actually out here today getting back to it. So we have been waiting for them to get this stuff in and today we showed up. So. Exterior lighting, we requested a quote from uh, Poly Electric, who's been involved with the lighting here before. Uh, Brian, Brian Munger had the idea to look into, we've been looking at whether we could potentially reduce some exterior lighting and still have a safe campus. Brian had the idea that maybe what we could do is look into key, key switches that kill a light post when, when you turn the key. So we've asked them to give us a quote on what that would cost to install eight, we have 36 <coughs> posts outside. We've asked them to 
let us know what it would cost to install kill switches on 18 plus 36. The idea would be if this works and it's not cost prohibitive, that when we figure out how many we can leave off on a regular basis, we do that when we know we have big activities happening here, there's going to be a lot of activity we can reactivate those and turn them on. Um, but we know through community comments that we all are very, very well that whether whether it, whether we are over over lit or not, it, it is a, I don't know if it's irrelevant, but the perception is definitely there. And so we're just looking to see what can we do at the same time of weighing that against making sure that whatever we do is safe for everybody that's here. And then the metal roof, we've had some issues, continue to have issues with with our roofing at different points with where it touches mates and walls where we have leakage. And so we had the company that installed the roof out here today along with the project manager from Hammond Construction, Bill Sherman, and spent three hours with them. And so there are troubles, they're brainstorming some potential solutions of what they can do to, uh, to fix this issue for us so that hopefully we can move beyond it. Have to keep that still, covered, still covered under initial warranties? Or? It depends. It, uh, it depends on whether or not it's installation related. They're actually going back and pulling out the drawings to see if indeed there may have been something that was not installed the right way. And it may not be, it, there, it's all speculative at this point, but it may not be a roof issue. It may actually be more of a masonry issue where water is absorbing in and coming down. So they're, they're pulling out, Bill is going to go and pull out the, the drawings, take a look at those and review them and get back to us with his opinion on what he believes our next step would be. So I'll keep you posted on that situation. Uh, NeoMed meeting, part of our fighter plan was to, to actively go out and try to collaborate more form partnerships with area colleges and universities. So as a first step in that direction, we reached out to NeoMed, which is New York mm -hmm. and we have a meeting scheduled with them next Wednesday at 10 with Dr. Gershon, the president, Kathleen Ruff, the mm -hmm. vice president for external affairs, and John Ray, the vice president for administration and finance. So I don't, you know, I'm not sure where that will lead. I don't know if my mind can only be two good things for us. So, we're, we're beginning that and starting to look at reaching out to some of these other universities too, even ones that we've had relationships with, to see if we can build stronger partnerships with them. And then the last thing I wanted to touch base on is this whole levy committee. As assuming we, this second resolution is adopted tonight for this continuing ballot issue for November, there's probably a need to get this levy committee up and running here actively pretty soon and talk about what type of approach to take. Um, I was, uh, two different things here. I, I wanted to make you aware of something that I, an organization I recently uh, learned about it would be something that the levy committee can decide if it's worthwhile or not. And then secondly, I wanted to hear if there was any thoughts or comments from you or a member on how we should proceed with the levy committee. Uh, but through, through actually our new school attorney with this and she had put me in contact with the communication firm that they worked with. And while we won't be doing anything with that communication firm because um, it's cost prohibitive, that communication firm directed me to an organization called Support Ohio Schools, which is a nonprofit organization out of Columbus that helps assist districts in running levy campaigns. Uh, examples of districts in the area that work with Manchester, Stowe, North Dominion, Wadsworth, Lordstown, and Roostown. So I talked to Andy Hawkins over in Roostown and he had nothing but good things to say about it. The intriguing thing about this organization, they provide a lot of support services, uh, voter lists that are much more detailed than what we can get from the Board of Elections. They have a method of actually taking other information they pull into it and, and giving you a target list of who they think the best voters are. Uh, even though you don't know that, from, you know, it's all scientific based on their, their criteria. But they do all of this assistance for districts and help you out and include that list for a cost of $400. Uh, 
uh, because they're able to get the rest of their funding to do their traveling and showing up and helping through grants. So it, it seems like even if it's just the list alone, that may be well worth the 400, but again, I think that's a discussion for the levy committee when that kicks up and running. But I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, I was curious if there's any any other thoughts of yours on the levy committee and when we should be going, how we should be going, if we want. We've kind of done two different approaches during the time that I've been here. Before I came on board with last November's election, there was already in place a community co-chairperson and a board of education co-chairperson for the last fall election. For May, we didn't do that. Uh, we did it a little bit differently. And so I don't know if there's any thoughts on anything like that. Tonight, or move forward with getting a commission meeting set up with some people and we can talk about that more. Is that what I 
Um, that I don't know. No, I don't believe so. No. Yeah, yes. I don't know. I was just curious. <coughs> Okay, and the personnel recommend to accept the resignation of Jessica Servanet, high school English teacher, effective for the 11-12 school year. Jessica unexpectedly decided to resign. She's in a situation where uh, her and her husband have two boys, I believe four and two, and she's going to be able to stay home with the boys during the day and then teach college level classes in, in the evening. So it, it was hard for her to walk away from that. Tell her that she came in to sit down, but it's a great opportunity for her, work, and I'm sure she won't regret it. Thank you. It's a great shape for us. We did have a lot of people that, that had suggested this year just to increase the class fees to help offset deficits. And we, we walk a very fine line with those fees. You know, we're allowed to charge a minimum fee for classes, but at the same time, we're supposed to be offering a free and appropriate public education. So we can't just jack up fees to help offset a deficit for what that's worth. That's why I make that. So we did not do that this year. Those just about, I think all of them stay the same. Uh, okay, item two, recommend to recall the following teachers for the 11-12 school year. And if I may, just a moment to, to clarify something on this. If you remember back in April, we, even though we had budgeted in for a 10% reduction in state funding, and we felt that based off of the governor's initial proposal, that's probably what would happen. We ended up cutting at a 20% level to be safe to meet contractual deadlines in case something happened before that budget got approved on June 30th. And so we overcut knowing at the time, and we publicized that, that we would most likely be recalling all of these people and staying at that 10% reduction. And so that's exactly what's happened here. We were able to. You know, we're still working to get these final numbers of the Senate version, which is what was approved for the budget. We're waiting on official confirmation from the ODE and stuff. But it, it looks like it was the best case scenario for us that it could have been as far as what the state budget was projected to possibly be, even though that still isn't going to mean a, a cut for us of somewhere probably close to 9 9%, 10%. So we're still anticipating cutting at that, at that 10 percent line. Uh, so the, the people that are being recalled here are people with the exception of Mildred Heath, people that fell below the 10 percent line. The tutors were completely separate because they dealt with federal money and we were able to get our initial allocations to be able to recall them. Uh, Mildred Heath is, is being recalled because Jessica Servant resigned and we needed to have her back here because we need that, that in this future. So with that being said, recommend you recall those teachers at this time of school year. Recommend you recall the following tutors for the 11-12 school year at four hours per day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. motion to recall the following tutors as listed for the 2011-12 school year at four hours per day. So moved. Second. Any questions for me? Roll call. Hot. Yes. John. Yes. Wilson. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Motion mm -hmm. passed. Recommend to approve an Amos stipend to Peggy Engelhardt for the 11-12 school year for the amount of $4,960. Now I'll just mention that our district, from my perspective, is very fortunate to have somebody like Peggy who's able to do this as a site. And there's many districts where this is a full-time position. 
in peg level of knowledge with this EMS is incredible. And she's definitely an expert. People call her for guidance and her her awareness of this and diligence in, in watching over this program and, and tracking where this money is being taken and stuff is paid off time and time again for our district for we've been able to go after and dispute some of the big claims of our student that's now somewhere else that they're trying to charge costs off to us. So that's you know, a, a small amount that we paid for her doing this is well worth uh, for the good results that we've Just a, just a note here, two uh, three little notes so that you know. The first two listed, Lisa Piles and Aaron Anderson, it's listed as a split. They are splitting one 6% contract. On the second page, Barb Burley, Brenda Elias, and Jessica Horning are splitting two junior class advisor uh, supplementals by three three people. Those are the dollar amount breakdowns. That, that total is the total amount of two supplemental contracts for that position. And then this Caitlin King ties into the next recommendation. Uh, Judy Harwell is asked to split her cheerleading stipend or supplemental with between her and this Caitlin King. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Recommend to amend the payment for Judy Harwell High School Cheerleading Advisor for the 11-12 school year from the 6% approved in May 17, 2011 meeting to $1,667. personnel addendum items on the, the addendum sheet. Number seven, recommend to issue a supplemental contract as assistant volleyball coach at the high school for Jessica Horning for the 11-12 school year, contingent upon criteria. Recommend to approve Lee Horning and Steve Jones as volunteers for the 11 12 football season, contingent upon full and complete compliance with the State of Ohio and Waterloo Board of Education eligibility criteria. I apologize for that. Um, just a note with this both of these individuals at the moment are not in coaching capacity. They will have their, their background and have had their background checks completed. They're doing more of uh, assistant work with Coach Bowling with filming and other things that are non-coaching related. If and when they do switch over to assisting and volunteer coaches, we will make sure that they meet all coaching criteria. And we wanted to get them approved and background check for just being around the kids in their non-coaching capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Recommend to approve a two-year contract for Doris Mills as cafeteria supervisor from August 1st, 2011 through July 31st, 2013 at a salary of $23,635. Just a comment on this. This position, cafeteria supervisor, has existed. Doris has been in that position. Uh, at the recent negotiations, we moved that position out of the union, out of the OFC union. The dollar amount here is identical to the dollar amount Doris would have received if she stayed in the union. So there's no, there's no net increase here with, with what's being done. It just has to be done this way because she's no longer covered under the OFC union. Okay, back to operations. One, recommend to approve the submission of the Waterloo Local School District application to the Ohio Department of Education requesting the use of two waiver days to implement a staff professional development program for the 11-12 school year. Did that last year. They were very successful here, so we'd like to continue to work. Okay, now motion to approve the submission of the Waterloo School District application to the OBE requesting to use the two waiver days. So moved. Second? Second. Any questions or comments? Welcome. Uh, yes. Dom? Yes. Will say? Yes. Project? Yes. Motion yes. Recommend to approve the PIC Head Start Disability Services Cooperative Agreement between the Portage Learning Centers and the Waterloo Local School District for the 11 12 school year. This deals with federal regulations and what we have to do to identify preschool age children. This is something I believe it's entered into by all Portage County school districts with, with the Head Start organization. This is a year Okay, I have a motion to approve the PIC Head Start Disability Services. Recommend to adopt a resolution for a Calamity Day alternative makeup plan contingent upon Waterloo Education Association approval. Just a comment on this. this. This is coming out of the blue to you guys, and I apologize for that, but we just recently found out, I think last Friday, there were some details of this that came out, and then I was on Monday and Tuesday, and was just able to clarify some stuff today with the state, and then been talking with Thora. The new budget bill allows districts the opportunity to make up, if you go in excess of the five allotted calamity days, you're now allowed to make up three days through online mediums or what they call uh, blizzard bags, where you pass out worksheets in a bag, basically, and you know, the kids. But what happened here is, so we found out about this last Friday, all the details of what had to happen, but the information was sent out. August 1st is the day that districts have to have a board resolution, a union support letter, and a plan submitted to the OPE to be able to participate for the upcoming school year. So we have not had time to really study this in depth of what that would actually look like in Waterloo. Dora, rightfully so, wants to talk with her executive committee. So what we, what we found out today we were able to do, and actually this is some news for you, I was able to talk to this Mr. Hubble at, at the ODE who's responsible for this. And what we can do is submit an initial plan with board resolution and hopefully a union uh, letter, if, if we can do that, and get that to him by August 1st. And then if we at any point during the school year decide that we do not want to do that for any reason, then all we do is pass another board resolution stating that instead of making it up through these online days or blizzard bags, that we would make them up as physical school days here in the program. So the only reason that I'm bringing this to you tonight is if we don't, we either have to call a special meeting if we decide to do this before August 1st, or we miss out on this opportunity that we may decide down the road is beneficial to all people involved in the 
So, I, so I'm putting it forth tonight to get our, I guess, foot in the door so we can study it further in conjunction with WBA. Terminated to proceed with the submission to the electors of the Waterloo Local School District the question of an additional tax levy for the purpose of current expenses in the amount of five dollars for a continuing period. Okay, and I should go through the resolution for the Waterloo School District to go to the electors for an additional tax levy for the purpose of current expenses in the amount of five dollars for a continuing period. Yes. How do you evaluate the gym teacher or the music teacher? 
and it, it's just, to me, it's just going to be a disaster. And uh, we require our districts to evaluate each teacher annually and set teacher graded as accomplished, may be evaluated every two years, will prohibit using seniority for reduction in force or rehiring, except when evaluations are comparable. So I guess if you have, have to reduce an English teacher and two people have the same evaluation, then I guess you can use seniority. I don't know. It's, it's going to be very complicated. Uh, one of the things that, you know, the budget is passed, and it's a two-year budget. So, Todd, you will eventually be finding out what you're going to be doing in the first year. But I was very surprised. I, uh, early last week, I got a call from the people at OSBA requesting me to be a part of a meeting with the governor's people on Thursday morning, July 28th. Where the governor's people want to, we're not sure really who's going to be there yet. Where there, he wants to come up with a new method of funding schools for the second year in the buy-in. It really kind of took me by surprise. Now I spoke to Andy and uh, the USBA is sponsoring a workshop along with LASA and the Treasury Organization. And there's a lady who is the assistant to the executive the director of the education of the government is going to speak there to the very that yes. now. Yeah. And uh, she's going to be bringing out some information on that to give to you. Yeah, yeah, Monday. Actually, it's going to be Monday. Yeah, but the, the, the governor has requested the committee of school board members to meet on the morning of July 28th at the Columbus uh, I guess we're going to listen to what's going on, whether we get feedback, I suppose we get feedback, I'm not sure we're going to listen. Mm -hmm. I just find it interesting because under Governor Strickland, you know, they went through a whole process, so it's being and up so some of the other organizations to provide a slew of input, and then for his funding part of it, he put it in place to kind of make a very small This might be getting into, you know, uh, Two years later, we have to go and get the money to get the dollars. Well, then, uh, one of the things that I kind of surprised is a lot of uh, pending bills, you know, the House Bill 136, the school choice legislation, uh, they kind of put it on hold until after they come back from recess. We don't know what's going to happen with that. But the House Bill 191, minimum school year. It seeks to establish a minimum school year for school districts based on hours rather than days of instruction. I found this very interesting. The bill would prohibit schools from being open for instruction prior to Labor Day or after Memorial Day. So you would have to have a school year start after Labor Day like we did a few years ago and then by Memorial Day. Uh, the bill's sponsor said that the schedule would benefit Ohio's tourist industry, adding that the inspiration for the bill came from a Buckeye Lake Oak Story district. So it kind of be interesting to see where that goes to go. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with the link. So that's all I have. Question, question. Would, the, would the rating system for the teachers, if they want, I was just reading that. Is that only for the schools that have adopted race to the top? No, that they. How, how does that, what's the difference between they, schools that have and the schools? School that districts have? receiving federal race to the top funds must use pay for performance criteria under a schedule based on license and evaluation. So they have to put something in immediately if they accept money for race to the top. Uh, School districts not receiving funds must use either a performance based salary schedule or a the, the evaluation is uh, we're going to put in that committee and I think the back this board. Yeah. But the performance plan is strictly your, you have to do it with your race plan. You have a choice. You put race plan. Okay, I get you have to. Well, because there's an article, I was going back to the there's an article in today's paper about the school district. It was some 
misinterpretations of how they did the contract and everything. But uh, the teachers there are pushing to get out of the place. I don't know, is that possible if you were in it? I don't know. You guys yeah. you to reject that? Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I thought that you could. I think after they initially had all the districts that said they were going to be in it and said they were going to use, there was a number that pulled out. I think after the state initiative we got the money. I mean, they, I'm not uh, sure what, how far in you can back out there. Yeah, but the superintendent there made a comment. Basically, he said there's going to be a lot of schools that are, that are uh, trying to get out of this town. Well, they, Governor Kasich used it as, a, as, as an example of use race to the top and the percentage of districts that are a part of it is its justification for all of this. One of the quotes that I read from him was, there's already 300 some districts that are doing this, or whatever the number is, that seems to justify the better occasions. And charge, and charge, and charge. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you.